Hi, everybody. Today we're going to talk about the uh, implicit function theorem. Let's start right out by saying, uh, let's suppose uh, suppose that uh, A, B, and C are uh, some given numbers, and let's also suppose we know that x and y will always satisfy the equation ax plus by equals c. So uh, x and y here are just uh, variables, numbers, real numbers. And let's refer to this equation as star. And now the implicit function theorem addresses two questions that naturally arise about this situation. So let's lay out the two questions. One question is whether star, whether this equation, whether this situation defines y as a function of x. It's certainly not written that way here. So, so let's say, does star define y as a function of x? And here I'll just write that as y equals f of x. And uh, let's write that a little bit more formally, a little more carefully here. So let me put the question mark out in front. And that is the question of whether there exists some function that maps from the x's to the y's, from r to r, so a real function, such that ax plus by equals c, if and only if uh, f of x. Maybe I should have written that y equals f of x. Um, that's the first question. And the second question is, uh, can we obtain the derivative of this function if it does exist? That is, if the answer to the first question is yes, can we obtain the derivative of that function from star, from the equation, or from this assumption, this supposition up here? And the implicit function theorem, which we typically just abbreviate as IFT, uh, provides answers uh, to both questions. And when I say it provides answers to the questions, well, it's either going to provide the answer yes or it's going to provide the answer no. But so what it's really doing is it provides sufficient conditions for the answers to be yes and tells us when those sufficient conditions aren't met, the answers might be no. So that's the sense in which the implicit function theorem provides these answers. Now, the, uh, in this simple case that we're starting with, linear expression, a linear function in two variables here, uh, linear equation, uh, and only the two variables, so that simple starting example, the answer to the questions is pretty obvious, it's pretty trivial. And in fact, uh, let's look first at uh, the graph of this equation. So here we have the graph of this equation in the case in which the a and the b coefficients are both positive 
or they're both negative. In other words, when the A and B coefficients have the same sign as one another, the graph is going to look like this. It's going to be a downward sloping line, because it's a linear expression, linear equation, downward sloping line in R2 in the x and y variables. And it's clear just from the picture that we indeed have a y being determined as a function of x by this line. It's easy to write down the uh, to write down that function explicitly, and it's clear that we can get the slope of the line, that is the derivative of that function, from the a and the b. And so let's actually do that down here because that is straightforward, simple. So we have this equation, I could rewrite it as by equals c minus ax. And we could rewrite that as y equals c over b minus a over b times x, so long as the b is not 0, because I can't divide through if b is 0. So if b is not 0, we can do this. And we would also have then have that this would be our function giving us y as a function of x. It would be this explicit function here, and the derivative of that function is clearly going to be minus a over b. And in fact, the derivative is the same everywhere. It's a constant because the slope of the line is the same everywhere. But we should qualify this, of course, by saying this is if b is not 0, because if b is 0, I can't do that. I just mentioned that this is uh, this is gives us y uh, as an explicit function of f, and uh, this then provides y as a function of x, but only implicitly, and that's why this is called the implicit function theorem. So let me say, let me add a couple of, uh, I guess, adverbs <laughs> to the first uh, question here. Say, does star implicitly define, um, perhaps I should have written here, a function. So let's just say an explicit function. So, so I've rewritten the question as, does this equation implicitly define an explicit f y as an explicit function of x. Here it's not explicitly a function, uh, but this says if the answer to 1 is yes, then y is implicitly is a function of x. And the implicit function theorem again gives us conditions under which the answers to both of these questions will be yes, that we will get an explicit function defined implicitly by the equation star. Let's actually draw this diagram uh, in cases where the A and the B don't necessarily have the same sign. Here we have uh, the situation where A and B, the two coefficients, have opposite signs. A is positive, B is negative, or vice versa. Uh, in that case, the line is going to be uh, upward sloping, and uh, our derivative will be positive, positive slope, but it's still the case that this will be the explicit function f that we get. It'll still be c over b minus a over b times x. We can still do this little al simple algebra, and it'll still be the case the derivative is minus a over b, but because a and b have opposite signs, the derivative will be positive, minus a negative number. And then here we have the situation where uh, a is 0. But again, b is still not 0. And so if a is 0, then what we have is that y equals just c over b, because this drops out, a is 0. y is c over b. y is a constant. It's still a perfectly good function, and it's still this function f of x is still 
c over b minus a over b times x, but the a is zero, so it's just c over b, and the derivative is a over b, but a is zero, so the derivative is zero. So this third situation, this third diagram here, the third case, where a is zero and b is not zero, everything still works fine. So in other words, this is correct so long as b is not zero. A can be anything, b can be positive or negative, and of course, in the fourth case, where b is zero and a is not zero, we have this picture here. We have a vertical line, and of course, in that case, I can't carry out this, uh, the algebra here because I can't divide by b, and indeed, I don't have y as a function of x because uh, the vertical line tells me, first of all, for any x other than, I guess it would be, <laughs> for any x other than c over a, uh, there is no y that satisfies the equation. And if x is equal to c over a, if I haven't made a mistake here, uh, if x is equal to c over a, there's a whole bunch of different y's that satisfy the equation. So again, we don't get a, a function, y as a function of x. So it's clear, it's intuitive, it's I guess even trivial, that uh, this is what we get for the linear case uh, with two variables, with uh, two real number variables. And the answer to our questions uh, are trivial to get. Yes, if b is not zero, we can get the derivative if b is not zero. No, if b, if b is zero. That's going to generalize. So as simple as these pictures are over here, they are going to prove to be useful because in a certain sense, those pictures, even in the nonlinear case, of course, we linearize everything with derivatives and we end up with the same kind of pictures, essentially. Uh, and these pictures work pretty well to give us intuition even when the x and the y variables are not one-dimensional, even if we've got n variables here and m variables here, for example. Um, so let's do uh, one more thing before we move to an example, an application in economics that perhaps motivate a lot of what we're, we're going to do here. So uh, for this, let's uh, set this off again. And let's say, suppose we write star, the equation star, as just f of xy equals c. So f of xy is now this uh, left-hand side. So I'm rewriting this now in a more general form as f of x and y. If I do that, then uh, the partial derivative of f with respect to x, which I'm going to just use f sub x for that partial derivative, that is a in our little linear example, and the partial derivative of capital F with respect to the y variable is b, pretty straightforward, okay? And so now I'm going to write down the answers to these questions. I'm going to basically write down the implicit function theorem for this simple case. And so that is, and I'll use a different color here to highlight this, the answer here is yes, if b is not zero, and can we obtain the derivative? Yes, the derivative is f prime of x is minus a over b, but that's fx divided by fy. So let's say that's f sub x divided by f sub y if b is not zero, b is f of y. So f sub y is not zero. That, without writing all the conditions down and everything, that is the implicit function theorem. It says, if I, and in fact, this is the implicit function theorem with a bunch of qualifications we're going to get to in a few moments. This is 
actually the implicit function theorem uh, even for a nonlinear function capital F because for the nonlinear function we no longer have A and B, we have just these partial derivatives, uh, but that's what we've got here. So uh, it is the case that if we have an equation f of x and y uh, is c, and we know that the x and the y have to always satisfy that equation, then uh, that will define the y as a, an explicit function of x, f of x, uh, and the derivative will be, the derivative of that explicit function will be the partial of f, capital F with respect to x, divided by the, the partial derivative of f with respect to y, negative. That will be the derivative if what's in the denominator <laughs> is an actual number. If the, uh, the denominator, f sub y, that partial derivative is not zero. Okay, so now we have a kind of a program that we need to uh, follow to uh, go beyond this simple linear two variable, one independent variable or uh, an exogenous variable, one uh, dependent variable or exogenous or endogenous variable in our problem. Uh, we need to go beyond this to get more variables. We need to go beyond this to deal with nonlinear functions, nonlinear equations, and we need to be able to deal with more than one equation, multiple equations. And so those three things are the things that we now want to address uh, as we go forward. And before we do that, let's, uh, let's look at an example uh, from economics, from microeconomics. So we're going to look at an economics exam, a standard economics example. You've probably all seen this example in your undergraduate uh, economics program. Um, and that, uh, we'll put that over here after we take off the, uh, the diagrams down here. Okay, so we'll be right back after we do that.